All right. Well, everyone, welcome. It is uh, now 12.03. I know other folks will be trickling in as we continue, but I want to introduce myself. I am Josh Zakum, Executive Director of Housing Forward Massachusetts. I want to start off by thanking our board, our team, uh, Kendall Feynman of the Housing Forward staff, as well as Abundant Housing Massachusetts, the Great Neighborhoods Network, uh, MHC, and our other community partners who have helped drive attendance and attention uh, to this series. For those of you that haven't had the opportunity, uh, we have been having these candidate conversations with the five folks who are running uh, to be Boston's next mayor. Uh, the prior conversations that happened throughout this week are posted on our website and on our YouTube page and our Facebook page. Uh, and today we are here with uh, the city's former chief of economic development, John Barros. Uh, this conversation obviously is here on Zoom, will be on our Facebook page and everything else. I wanna thank everyone for taking the time to be here. I'm gonna sort of lay the groundwork briefly uh, before I turn it over to John to talk about his vision uh, for housing in the city of Boston. These conversations have come out of Housing Forward's report, a housing blueprint for Boston's next mayor, which was released about a month and a half ago. And in it contains several specific recommendations for fostering a sort of a pro-housing climate in the city of Boston to address our affordability challenges. There are concrete uh, proposals in there that I'm gonna get into a little bit later around upzoning, parking minimums, accessory dwelling units, things of, of that nature. Also, we'd like to hear from our mayoral candidates about their philosophies for appointing people to the regulatory boards, like the BPDA, the ZBA, the Zoning Commission, and things of that ilk. So to kick things off, I'm gonna turn it over to you, John, if you wanna just introduce yourself, maybe talk a little bit about housing policy. I'll follow up with some questions, and then we'll take questions that were both emailed ahead of time and live uh, from the audience here. So thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Josh. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And uh, housing is incredibly important. Um, you know, a little intro on me and, and my position on housing. I am uh, a Boston native, born and raised in Roxbury to um, parents from West Africa, from Cape Verde. And they came here, you know, frankly, to, you know, give us a, a more opportunities than we can find in Cape Verde, particularly around education. But I was fortunate to have parents that were able to buy their homes very early on. My father bought a home in Roxbury in the, in the late 60s um, that he raised all five of us in. And that kind of stability, that kind of quality uh, in affordable housing was important for my ability to be a good student, which is really what was important to him and my ability to sort of focus on other things that mattered. Um, However, Boston continues to be a city that's too expensive for many families and too many of our families are being displaced from our neighborhoods and, and with that kind of instability, it's hard to show up to school and, and do well. It's hard to you know, try to get a job and have a career. We need to be a city that creates opportunities for all of our residents and our families to be able to, to, to stay and not get pushed out. Affordable housing is a social determinant for good health affordable housing or quality living and quality housing as a social determinant for good academic success and for economic mobility. So thanks for holding this today and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. So let's let's jump right into it. So um, the city report, you know, housing a changing city that you had a role in overseeing uh, during the Walsh administration says that it was recently updated to say that we need 69,000 units of new housing in the city by 2030, just to meet you know, current expected demand. Uh, the population is supposed to grow to around 760,000 people. Uh, as I often say, uh, I'm glad people wanna come to the city of Boston, that makes me proud, but it also has challenges um, about providing opportunities and housing for folks, um, both who have lived here and grown up here and who are coming here for school, uh, jobs, that sort of thing, uh, You know, the lifeblood of a thriving city. So what are a couple things that you'd like to see um, that you could do as mayor um, to increase the production of housing at all levels of the market? Obviously, low income, affordable, middle income uh, and market rate housing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, uh, you know, great point. I think first, you know, let me you know, comment on your point. We, we set up a target of 69,000 uh, houses or, or housing units in the city of Boston, but, but really we did that um, based on one projection of growth. And, um, you know, Josh, we, we under projected. There were more people that came to Boston than we thought during a short period of time. And as you know, we were, we're on track to meet the 69,000, but we need to increase that number. 69,000 is no longer enough 
for the city of Boston. In fact, the new McKinsey, um, I think the McKinsey report that came out called for us to build at least 125,000 units of home to keep up with the growth of our city. We're already at a city of about 750 a uh, thousand residents um, and growing. And in fact, as you said, you know, the reason why people come to Boston is because of the quality of life, because of the opportunities, because of the jobs, because, you know, our city is doing well and we want to continue to do well, but that comes with challenges and, and, and building more housing is one of those challenges. Proud to have been part of a city administration that built, you know, record numbers of housing in our, in, during that time, during the seven years build record numbers of affordable housing during that time, during the seven years. And I think now we need to set up to do more. Um, I think as you ask about my, you know, two to three ideas of what we can do to build more, we need to make sure that we're using all city resources to build more affordable housing for seniors, for people with disabilities, for young professionals, for young families who need to then upgrade and have more, more living space. So I, I've said, I, I will push that all city owned land is used to build housing. Um, and leverage city buildings to create adjacent housing. And I think, you know, I led the effort in Upham's Corner to acquire land in Upham's Corner to help create, to be a catalyst for economic development, but to also build affordable housing for that neighborhood. And then uh, to work with the mayor where he allocated with the help of the, of the city council, of course, uh, you know, $20 million for a new library. Um, and with the idea that we could build affordable housing on top of that library. We can build mixed use housing, uh, a mixed use building with some commercial space on the first floor with affordable housing and then make it for all income levels. It is critical that we provide housing for all income levels and not just you know, uh, a city that is gonna be for the very low income and those who can purchase market rate. We also need to call on the state and the federal government to contribute more to our affordable housing in the city of Boston. Uh, I think we have a federal government that we can work with. I'm well positioned to work with the Biden administration and of course our secretary of labor to bring as much resources to Boston to build more as possible. And then you know, lastly, we need to make sure that we are in, uh, increasing the investments in the city's home ownership program and mortgage products. We've got a pretty good product uh, we need to increase the down payments that, that people can get from the city. And then we need to be able to buy down the interest rate so people have more buying power as they go out there to try to buy housing. Those are all great. And I want to go back to the, the first one you mentioned about, you know, building housing on public buildings. You know, that's something that I know uh, my former colleague, Frank Baker, uh, often talked about in the city council. And yeah. it's it makes a lot of sense. It's often popular in neighborhoods. It provides an opportunity to build more city infrastructure, whether it's a library, uh, a school, you know, what, whatever is going to go there. How, how do we do that? though, you know, thoughtfully, how do we maximize the potential of that? And again, how do we address what is often still, you know, opposition uh, in many neighborhoods to, to things like that? How will you balance the need for new housing production uh, with the potential uh, opposition? That's right. No, you know, I, I was proud to have uh, co-chaired Imagine Boston 2030. And in Imagine Boston 2030, we learned that there were neighborhoods and parts of the city that people were excited to see more density. People wanted to see growth. They wanted they wanted the city to come in and help plan for more units of housing and, and a more robust commercial Main Street. And so uh, Upham's Corner was one of them. But, you know, the Andrew Square, you know, area was another. I mean, there, there are a number of, of, of them around the city. Um, and, and so I was proud to then work with uh, residents to upzone where we needed or to talk about how we can have more density in different projects in that area. It doesn't make sense to build dense everywhere, but it absolutely makes sense to build density where you have uh, transit infrastructure, where you have local amenities that need patrons, that need uh, customers. And so some of our main streets get it. Um, um, and, I, and, I, and I'm a big proponent of, of working with the neighborhood working with the neighborhood on community planning so that you know everything is clear. So when the developers come in, we know what's gonna be what's gonna be supported and what's not. When when the city comes to try to help out, we know what neighbors want. And so as as uh, you know the former chair of the Imagine Boston 2030, I think the roadmap is pretty clear. And a large part of our city wants to grow, thinks they can have more density, and we need to continue to work with them to do it. Thank you. Um, so going on to this thing on the density, uh, line line of thought here um you know a lot of cities uh peer cities that have affordability issues offer density bonuses 
to uh, developers who are building, you know, say a market rate project that could be 10 stories tall, you know, under current zoning. And, you know, if they do X number of affordable, they can go, you know, X percentage larger. Um, what are your thoughts on that approach? And if, if you've thought about any, you know, specific bonus numbers that you, you would think make sense? Yeah, I think I think that's the right approach. I think that, um, you know, let's let's look at some of the neighborhoods around the Fairmont line that have called for more affordability. Well, I think if the developer can deliver more affordability, they're willing to allow for more density. It's it's a, it's on a line that's underdeveloped. And, you know, the neighbors have been clear about what the benefits are that they really treasure. And so I think in that instance, the, the instance, the city should be working with developers for more bonuses, uh, for more scale, or even to you know provide some subsidies in other ways that help to meet the vision and the goals of those neighbors. Could I was able, please? Joshua, to oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. I was able to work with a developer on a, on a on a on a um, you know sort of creating some bonus and incentive uh, that actually was about scale and height on Huntington Ave, for example where the developer worked with us on a community benefit that allowed the Huntington Theater to own their own theater and then have some financial value, economic value within the development the developer was gonna build. So we transferred rights to the adjacent uh, parcel and then the developer was able to build a 30 story building with the support of the neighborhood. Why? Because the community benefit was clear, what people were getting out of it was clear and it, it didn't, it wasn't presented and in fact was not a greedy developer coming in to make money on the backs of the community. No, it was a partnership. And I think the city can do more of that. We can be at the table as we as we help to uh, bridge the community's vision, bridge the community's plans and desire for benefits with what the developer wants to do and help facilitate and make that happen. I think the Huntington uh, is a great example uh, of something that, that worked well, but it's also somewhat unique. I mean, do you envision codifying you know, certain percentages and, and it would have to be in the zoning code. Um, and as a follow on, you know, how will you as mayor evaluate um, potential board members of the zoning commission, the BPDA, the ZBA and their approach to, to housing? You know, I, I uh, we've had this conversation inside the, uh, as a member of the Walsh administration, I remember Brian Golden and I sitting at a table one day and talking about codifying some of these benefits and some of these bonuses. We then talked to some developers and it was a mixed reaction. Some developers said, hey, look, if you start codifying some of this, it's just an added bur burden, an added tax. It feels like we've got to be able to negotiate these things with, with market conditions at the table, right? What can we do today? What makes sense? Does a, does a density bonus make sense in today's market for a certain type of development? Yeah, it might. But for that development, it might not make sense tomorrow. And so, you know, people really wanted to say, hey, outline uh, for each neighborhood what's important so developers can come to the table understanding that. But then let's talk about how we pay for that, right? And how we get that done. And as market conditions change, how we pay for it will change. And the city's got to be able to be at the table and be really creative with developers to understand what today can get you from an extra two floors versus tomorrow. Well, I want to, uh, first I want to remind folks who are, who are tuning in that if you use the Q&A box, uh, some questions have come in, but want to, I think I forgot to mention that at the beginning, please go ahead and use it. Um, again, keeping on density, but going to the other end, um, a lot of peer cities, um, particularly in the Northwest and in Minnesota, uh, Oregon, have changed their zoning to allow three family houses or triple deckers uh, as of right on almost every residential lot. Now that's increased density, obviously, on the other side of things from a Huntington Theater type project. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Again, obviously it doesn't work in every neighborhood, but you know, writ large, hundreds of lots, that's, that's a lot of housing and that's often family housing too. Yeah, no, I, I, so I agree. I think first and foremost, let's just agree, it doesn't work in every neighborhood. There are some neighborhoods where that's not the right uh, uh, strategy. But, you know, through the Imagine Boston 2030 plan, it works for many neighborhoods. It works that you can create uh, an opportunity for people to scale up a little bit or scale up a lot. I mean, there were some neighborhoods that were ready to go five, six uh, stories. Um, and in many ways, it made sense for them. There were other neighborhoods who said to us, hey, look, we, we'd like to enhance what we have, but we don't think a lot of scale makes sense. So how do we enhance what we have? How do you add the, the DMUs or, you know, uh, uh, really sort of build out basements in ways that make sense? And so you can create more units, but scale is not changing for us. And so I think that's, that's what we need to look at. We need to look at ways where we can add units and maybe not create so much scale 
and at the same time respect where we have residents that that think that their neighborhood can can take on more density that we work with them and we and they were creative with developers and make that happen yeah great and and i want to go back so we're talking about you know codifying and our zoning and a question just popped in uh right on that so i'm going to go early to the audience questions but here it is you know imagine boston 2030 other plans that are made through the bpda through the administration many you know while you were there good hard work residents participated um and but they end up being guidelines or recommendations um you know would you codify those into zoning is there another approach to make sure that when people i think often you know neighborhood volunteers people who live here are putting a lot of time and energy into this but they want to see it you know in place what are your thoughts on that yeah, I you know, first um, uh, I spent 13 years as executive director of the Dudley Street Neighbor Initiative doing neighborhood planning, doing neighborhood uh, master planning with the city as a partner. And what I recognized during that process is oftentimes the community will plan and will try to create the best neighborhood possible. But when the community plans and tries to create uh, sort of value and quality of life, it, it sometimes needs subsidies from the city. Right. If we are just planning and unfortunately, and, and Brian and I have had these these tussles at the BPDA where, you know, we can't just plan for what the the uh, private developer can can build. We can't just plan and say, hey, private developers make this work. It just doesn't work. As the Dutch Street Neighborhood Initiative, we recognize we need a city to assist, the city's assistance to bridge the gap between what the community wanted and what the private development can work. Sometimes, you know, it's in things like density bonus, but in other times it's it's about, you know, creating subsidies and in, 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 in taxes, maybe a TIF, uh, maybe a DIF, um, maybe a pilot where it made sense so that the community in fact can get what they needed. Um, it's, it's important that the city, as we work with neighborhoods, that we don't just hinge on what the private market can give us, but that we have a commitment as a, a, a municipality that we will partner with that neighborhood to make sure that we have fidelity to the plan and that we make sure that we are working and being creative. As executive director of Dudley Student Able Initiative, I was able to use a lot of uh, BPDA, then BRA, BRA tools, like eminent domain authority, the 121 agreement. We created the largest urban land trust in the country to help protect the parks, the green space, the affordable housing we were building. We've got to get creative, but the city's got to be at the table to, be, to get creative so that we can meet that, uh, that kind of innovation, that kind of, you know, you know, really creative problem solving to get what the neighbors want to see. So as mayor, I just want to commit to be far more involved in the problem solving of bridging the cost gap between what the neighbors want to see and what the private developers can pay for so that we can actually build these, um, implement these plans and build our neighborhoods the way we want to see them. Interesting, thank you. Um, you mentioned community land trust and you have some unique experience uh, in that area amongst the, the field of candidates. Can you talk a little bit more? Can you explain briefly maybe to folks who might not know what those are and then you know how you see that playing a role across the city because it, it, it it's a challenge it's hard to get these done but uh, you've done it um can you talk a little bit about how that happens and if we can do more of it in the city of austin well, absolutely uh josh you know the community land trust is really just a creative way to remove the cost of land in development one and make the development more affordable and i'll talk about that a little bit but also to have a partnership with the homeowner. In our case, that's one of the things we really wanted to do because we had some, we, want, we were really pushing for uh, new homeowners, first time homeowners coming in and we say, look, we're gonna be a partner with you. This is not scary. Uh, we'll help you come to our neighborhood. Now remember, this is building in a time when, you know, our neighborhood was not attractive. High crime, empty lots, uh, people weren't building, right? So we were, we were a neighbor group saying, no, growth is important. And we need to build in our neighborhood. And so we need to tell people we're going to be we're going to be partners with them. And so as a land trust, we said, look, if you can't sell your home for what you built, uh, bought it for, we will pay for it at an increase. Right. So that's a huge uh, advantage for a land trust to be able to bring people into places that are that, that don't have a lot of demand. The other thing we did, though, is also to preserve use. So we know that the, the speculative market wasn't going to come in and buy our parks and buy our playgrounds and build on it. We said to the neighborhoods, we said to the neighbors, the new neighbors, you'll always have this park here because it's gonna be on our land trust and we're gonna help preserve it. You'll always have the three acres of urban land and farming that we have now in our neighborhood because we're gonna preserve it. So it's a way to have a partnership for a whole community to steward 
the vision for their neighborhood, but also have a, partners, a partnership with homeowners or business owners to make sure that we're going at it together, and then to help preserve affordability in perpetuity. As mayor, I believe that there are some uh, neighborhoods that we should go in and we should buy some land and help build with them. I also believe as mayor that one of the ways to make it affordable and bridge the, build the, uh, bridge the cost gap between what the neighborhood, neighborhood wants to see and the community's plan and what developers can pay for is to remove the cost of land. So you go in, you buy land, and then you lease it. And then you allow for a little bit more creativity, allow for a little bit more uh, uh, both resident control and stewardship and a little bit less cost on the developer side so they can get creative with what they, what, what they should do. You know, you know the, the, the residents of Hyde Park, for example, are asking for the next mayor to buy Crane Ledge. I think we can. I think there's a creative way to buy a, a Crane Ledge, pay fair market value for it, and then begin to think about what you can do with Crane Ledge in terms of restorative work and what parks you can build. What happens is studies show that a good green open space adds about two and a half percent of value to adjacent real estate almost on an annual basis. Having quality green open space then increases value around us for real estate around us where we can continue to build. So let's pay that forward. Let's pay that forward, um, but work with residents to buy green space, work with residents around climate resilience and being a city that has more opportunities for people to come together. Why? Because it will continue to add value to our real estate and continue to add and uh, allow us to, to finance forward some of the things we want to do. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. It's, in, it's an interesting approach. And it's one that's often talked about, you know, in think tanks and policy, but it's been proven hard across the country, not just in Boston, to put into action. So, you know, it's, it, it's great to have your perspective uh, as someone who's worked on that uh, in the past. Um, go back to questions here uh, from the audience. Here's one that's come up quite a bit um, around parking uh, and parking minimums in zoning. Um, you know, there's currently a proposal before the city council um, to eliminate any parking requirements for affordable uh, housing developments. Um, but also, listen, there's a lot of advocacy in the community that we should be either reducing or eliminating parking minimums altogether that we're often choosing between more housing or parking, both in financial, in dollars and cents, yep. but also in the space. Um, other cities, uh, you know, are going back and forth on this. There are a lot of studies out there. I'm happy to share some with you, um, as well as uh, your administration in the future. Um, can you speak a little bit to your thinking on uh, parking minimums for all affordable projects, and then maybe a little more broadly for, for projects across the city? Yeah, no, absolutely, Josh. This is where, you know, sort of some of these questions um, you know, they ask you quick questions and you got to give an answer. And sometimes when it's a complex answer, you, you give us somewhat support, right? And so I appreciate the, uh, the anonymous attendees uh, question here. Yeah, it's somewhat support because I think in some neighborhoods, you actually need to have parking because you have transit deserts. And, you know, residents have been really clear that unfortunately there's a lot of cars that come to that area and you know, they, need, they need to be able to manage the in and out, particularly for the main streets. And in, in certain places in for, for our main streets, if you don't have parking, you don't have customers. And I recognize that for our small businesses, it's really critical. And we need to make sure that we, ad we, we address that. You know, I, I did a lot of work with um, the Upham's Corner uh, revitalization uh, effort that we just put on. And, and the parking question there was about the Strand Theater. It's critical that the Strand Theater had parking. And so as we're trying to build more affordable housing and we're thinking about parking, we actually needed to have early conversations with the state because we know parking is a burden for affordable uh, building. We know parking is a burden for timeline. And so we had early conversations with the state to talk about how they can st step in and help uh, meet some of those challenges. But yes, there are developments across the city and neighborhoods that, that don't you know, need, frankly, that don't need any parking. And we know that there are parking lots out there that are not being used and that there are parking spaces that are redundant. And so as, as mayor, I'd love to do more local planning. It is important that we do local planning and some of, some of our, uh, our decisions, our policy decisions make sense for the local market, make sense for the local community. And so uh, I am a big fan of making sure that we do not have parking where we don't need it. And in, in, in many of the neighborhoods of our city, that is the case. Great. And I just want to add, and it doesn't require any additional comment, but I think a lot of the talk around this, particularly around the affordable projects, is that abutters 
are using the parking required under zoning as sort of a pretext for opposing and delaying projects that that are needed. So I, I think that's um, you know part of the, part of the genesis for Councillors Bach and O'Malley's uh, uh, proposal on this. But um, move, moving moving down the list a little bit, um, question is you know compared to the other candidates, you have unique experience with the BPDA or previously known as the BRA. Um, you know, is there anything in particular you would want to change? In the agency, or how do you envision their role in accelerating uh, the permitting uh, and construction of the needed workforce and, and affordable housing in the city of Boston? First, let me just start with that uh, with that second question. Um, that's exactly how I would change the BPDA. We need to, in fact, accelerate the permitting and construction process and for a lot of things in Boston. Housing is one of them. In order for us to to, to cut some of the costs that it takes for developers, we need to we need to make sure that the the soft costs. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of, in a lot of instances, things that we can control, we, we are managing and, and, and expedi you know, you know, creating some um, uh, streamlining and, and efficiencies in our process will help do that. And I think the BPDA can do a lot better in, 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 in making sure that that happens. But, but you're right, I do have some experience working with the BPDA and there are some amazingly important tools of the BPDA. I continue to hear candidates talk about, um, you know, changing the BPDA and, and one candidate particularly eliminating the BPDA. I mean, there are some tools without the BPDA the city can't do. I just acquired three and a half acres of land to help a community build out its, its community plan. Without the BPDA, I couldn't do that because the only eminent domain authority that the city has is for municipal use. And building affordable housing is not a municipal use. And so the BPDA, BPDA also manages our LDAs, which actually holds community benefits. I mean, there's a number of things that the BPDA uh, if, if positioned as a partner to, to work with communities and neighborhoods can be super uh, 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 effective and efficient and, and frankly, the only legal tool we have in getting some things done. I would reorganize the BPDA. Splitting up planning in, in, in neighborhood is one, as planning and development is one way to go about it. I would actually uh, change the BPDA where planning is an authority. Is, is, is hierarchically shifted over development and development is responding to planning, not put them side by side. I think there it would eliminate bureaucracy where you have decisions that are clearly being made with one group and not a, a, a tug of war with, with two groups. I think it's super important. At the same time, I don't think we should put the burden of notification on developers. The city should have the burden of notification. Our, our Office of Neighborhood Services should make sure everyone's notified and then we should make sure that at the end of the day that we are comfortable with the process and that there's access translation and information uh, in a way that allows for residents to move forward on a, on a decision quicker than some of the some of the back and forth that we have now when we had a community meeting and then some people are coming in and they're saying that community meeting is no good because notice wasn't done right, et cetera, et cetera. Let's eliminate all of that. Let's control that and let's make sure we do this right the first time. Yeah. Well, building off on that, and thank you, thank you for the answer. Is um, you talk about soft costs um, to projects, and those obviously get passed on to a future renter or homeowner in higher costs um, as projects take longer to get approved. People are spending on architects; they're spending on you know uh, payments on the actual land, um, lawyers, etc. You know, what are your thoughts on whether it's at the BPDA or another agency having, you know, more and dedicated staff to help at least on the small and medium sized projects, the folks who may not have, you know, a cadre of, of in-house lawyers to get them through that? Is that something you've looked at either in your prior role or in the campaign looking to be, you know, to, as a mayor or how would you address that? Yeah, no, it, it is for sure. I mean, so one of the challenges that we have, Josh, and you know this very well, is our, our zoning is outdated. Um, and so everything needs a variance. Um, and we need to address that. We need to address that by making sure that for every developer, it is clear what you should be doing and what you should be intending to build. So that the medium sized developer, you know, doesn't have to figure out what are the things I'm going to have to get a no on first. And then what do I need to do to go over that barrier so that I can get a yeah. I mean, it's just a we know that everybody who goes to 1010 Mass Ave is getting a denial letter first. That is just a sad way to begin. I've had small developers come to me and said, and say, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I said, why, why couldn't you do it? Well, I got a denial letter from 1010. I said, well, did you get that right after the application? Yes. All right, let me talk to you about the process. That should not be our process 
it's disheartening. And then you have to go find a lawyer so they can figure out why the zoning is off and what you're trying to do. But but really, there's political uh, will to do it. Oh, is there? So there's a there's a it's 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 really difficult for any developer, particularly medium sized, smaller developer to really understand what the city's gonna ultimately support or what the zoning board is gonna ultimately support, what the BPDA is gonna ultimately support, unless you're staying you know, in tune with all of the conversations, all of the policies, all of the new things that are being discussed. We need to in, uh, update our zoning so that people don't have to go through that process. It'll cut time, it'll cut costs, but more importantly, it'll allow for more people to feel comfortable developing in our city, and we should do that immediately. Well, that's great. And I think that sort of answered the next question uh, that we had here in, in the chat box. Um, but, you know, on, on that front, we're talking about, you know, people developing in the city, building in the city, um, you know, going before the different boards. You know, what are your thoughts? Obviously, the mayor uh, appoints the four out of five BPDA board members, appoints the zoning commission and the ZBA. Um, you know, how do you look at that? How would you evaluate, you know, I don't know if applicants is the right word, nominees? Um, for those roles, because there's a lot. I mean, it's not just, yes, we want to see more production to meet the 70,000 or, as you said, 125,000 new homes that we need in the city of Boston. Um, you know, what characteristics, what experience do you look for, uh, would you look for, I should say, on those, on those boards and commissions? Yeah, no, great question. You know, first, I think there is an important role for the city council in that conversation. There's an important role for hearings. Now, I would hope that as we're looking for volunteers to, to help sit on these boards, that we are you know, not disrespectful, that we're gentle. And if someone disagrees that someone should sit on the board, it's okay. I mean, that's what those conversations are for. And in fact, uh, it's healthy. Uh, but you know, we want to do it in a way where the public, in fact, has an opportunity to have a conversation. Why are you putting, why are you recommending that person? What are you trying to get to? It is important that we have certain views and certain experiences. So that when we have, you know, the BPDA board, as somebody feels comfortable using some of the tools that the BPDA has, that someone is on that board, in fact, in alignment with the mayor, what the mayor wants to do. Um, you know, I've often heard mayors talk about BPDA as if it's some sort of separate, separate governance, right? And we don't want that. You want, in fact, to hold the mayor accountable for what the BPDA does or does not do. The only way to do that is to make sure that the, the process of appointment is clear and transparent, that there are hearings, and at the end of the day, that you're hearing the mayor's thought process, where, where he or she is trying to go, that the city council is engaging in, in questions that are helpful for the public, and that we're moving in that direction. Diversity of, of, of background, of career, of perspective matters, so that in fact, we can have healthy debates and healthy conversations as part of these uh, groups. Expertise also matters to make sure that we can have you know, people who understand how to be creative, problem solve, and understand how to move these agencies, boards, commissions forward, it's critical. I was proud as a member of the Wall Street administration to take a look at a couple of different things on our, on our boards and commission. One, we were woefully underrepresented in terms of women on our boards and commission. So we did a lot of work to make sure that there, were, there was better gender equity. And then we did a lot of work to make sure that there was uh, uh, racial diversity, but also geographic diversity. There were certain neighborhoods that were overrepresented and other neighbors that weren't. So we made sure to make sure that there was more of a, of a, of a well-represented group. And I think that that's important. It is important that we think about all of these things without you know, uh, overthinking it and making, and making it where we can't appoint anybody because in fact, we're trying to get everybody on. And you know, there's not enough seats to do that. Excellent, thank you. Um, one, one question that I think is important in a state like Massachusetts, a city like Boston, um, the rules of the Commonwealth, the laws of the Commonwealth, I should say, mean a lot of things have to go through the state house, uh, through a home rule petition or otherwise. You know, Obviously the mayor of Boston has probably the biggest megaphone in the state next to possibly the governor for drawing attention to important issues, uh, challenges, policies, but you still have to go up there uh, to Beacon Hill, uh, have that discussion. What, you know, could you name maybe one or two of your top priorities for state law changes when it comes to housing uh, and development, um, or maybe even just the things you would look to uh, from the state on that front? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a good point. I think, you know, there, there are a couple of things that I'm going to be really specific on this uh, answer. Uh, first, I mean, I'll, I'll be general, which is, you know, I have enjoyed a really good uh, relationship with my counterparts at the state, uh, Mir Walsh. I thought set a great example for all of us in terms of how we work well with the state, 
make sure that there is a good city state relationship. But here's, here's a couple of things that I think uh, I would advocate sp specifically in this area to make sure that the state is a better partner on. Uh, we used to have, I think you remember the IQ uh, uh, product where the state would help provide infrastructure dollars to developments of certain sizes. I think we need to return to that, particularly when it, as it comes to uh, housing. The state, the state uh, did it in terms of jobs and, 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 and taxes, income taxes specifically. We need to do it, uh, we can return to the jobs one. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great one, but we need to do it in terms of housing and affordability. Um, they've now made that a priority. Let's make sure we can have some infrastructure dollars that help to both in, incentivize uh, some of the infrastructure building that we wanna see, but also cut costs on those projects. It is, it's a great product and we should, we should, do, we should use it more. Um, uh, the, um, the other piece that I think the state could do better is uh, give us more authority to help with the taxes. Um, time and time, I mean, look, we, we're talking about building new and it's important to build new, but at the same time, I've heard it, particularly from our elders, that as taxes increase, we need to have more authority to do exemptions. We need to be able to keep up with the exemptions for those who, have, who are on fixed income. So we're not creating more uh, issues and pressures around displacement in our city. Those are the kinds of things that I think I would ask for immediately so that I can begin to manage some of the housing issues that we have locally. Thank you, great, great answers. Um, I do remember IQ to uh, some projects in my former district uh, that took advantage of that program. Um, I see we have another question that popped in here. Um, it's, you, you addressed it somewhat, so don't feel that you need to completely rehash it, but it's, you know, how do you balance what we all acknowledge is a critical need for more housing production, especially lower, uh, low income, middle income units, but there's also, you wanna listen to the needs and the views of people currently in the neighborhood, but that's all, those are often uh, in conflict. You know, how do you, how do you measure that? Does it, you know, how do you take that sort of citywide approach to what we need as a city versus what a certain neighborhood or block or district may feel differently? It's not an easy question. Yeah, no, not, not, an, not an easy question, but an important question. And I think, I think that's where, you know, the, 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 my, my, my position on making sure that the city is working with neighborhoods on what they think the, the, the benefits are or the things they wanna invest in, right? And then working with development or developers to make sure in fact that, that we're talking directly and specific to those benefits. Look, as, as co-chair of Imagine Boston 2030, you know, it's not like any neighborhood, and I'm trying to just think back. We, we engaged 30,000 residents of the city of Boston during that process. And I can't remember any neighborhood that said absolutely no development. But I do remember neighborhoods saying, hey, look, in, 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 on, on this, on this, in this part of the city, we think it's two families or we think it's three families. And, you know, uh, can, we get, can we get a certain ratio to the size of the lot that allows for, you know, driveways? Or can we, you know, there was, there was just a, so, so everybody's got like a, an idea for what works for their neighborhood. Well, let's work with that. Let's start there. Let's then talk about sort of how we continue to grow in a way that makes sense for that neighborhood. And I, that's the approach that I would use, but I think benefits and, and how the, uh, 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 we can create benefits for that neighborhood as they grow, whether it's redoing sidewalks or redoing streets or you know thinking about sewage issues in terms of stormwater management, whatever it is, there's ways to think about how growth can help make us a city that is able to better respond to those things. And I think we've got to link the two in terms of benefits to neighborhoods in a very direct way and the growth of our city, even to the extent, I mean, I had one young person say to me, oh, the, the seaport is a disaster. And I said, well, that's interesting. Um, in our first conversation, you wanted to see more uh, investment in schools. And in this conversation, let me just talk to you about how the seaport helps the city provide more investments in schools. Now we could do the seaport you know, better, but it's not because we're going to not build those buildings, right? It's, it's, it really, that those benefits help us invest in things that matter for our city. They help us bring jobs to the city. I mean, there's so many benefits. We've got to be able to do a better job of correlating benefits of investment to, 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 to the development that we're doing. And, and let me just do this, Josh. I see Jesse's point of eliminating parking minimum doesn't mean the developer can't build parking. But one of the things that I'm, you know, so developers say to me all the time, and I'm a big fan of, is to be clear on what we're looking for, right? And if there are parts of the city where we think there's gotta be at least a minimum, 
right? Like I just, I just talked about Upham's Corner around the Strand Theater. Then we should just say it to developers so that they can factor that in, right? So that they can come in and say, in this part of the city, they're looking for, because Strand Theater or in this part of the city on main streets, they typically need it in High Park because, you know, transit and some other things, whatever it is, that we're being clear with developers about those minimums in ways that they, they are factoring it when they buy the, the land and they're thinking about what they should be proposing. I think that kind of, you know, sort of clarity is really helpful for everybody. Well, thank you. And uh, I wanna give you, uh, you know, a chance to, to wrap things up. We're approaching 1245. I wanna be respectful of your time uh, on the campaign trail and, and everyone else's. Is there anything else you'd like to add on, uh, on housing, um, policy development, anything we, we missed or, or that you wanna reemphasize? Well, I think, you know, housing is critical. Like I said, it's the social determinants for so much of the success for our residents, our children, our families. Um, it, we know uh, that without housing, people are in worse position to be able to succeed, whether in schools or, you know, whether they, uh, on, on, in health and health outcomes and in economic mobility. And so this is a, it's, it's a really important thing for the next mayor. You know, the, the one thing I'll leave with all of, of those who are listening to us today is that I believe I'm the candidate with, the, with, with by far the most uh, experience in housing, in, in urban planning, but in, in executing housing. As, as executive director of Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, I personally put deals together and, and built in very creative ways in, in, in markets that, that had zero demand. Um, and then as chief of economic development, was proud to be part of a, a, an administration that both built housing, tried to be more efficient, but also did things like work with the business community to increase um, our, our linkage fees, 42% increase in linkage fees so that we can have more revenues to build housing. There is a way to balance this. And I, th I think there were some really difficult and maybe harmful um, positions by some of our candidates out there that would take us back. I think rent control is one of them. Uh, you know, the moratorium on development is another one. There, if, if we're going to address our affordable housing issues, it's gonna be because we do production and then production of more affordable at the same time. And as mayor, I've, I've got the experience and the executive skill to help meet this challenge for the city of Boston. So I ask you to consider me, check out my website and my housing plan specifically at barrowsformayor.com and then humbly ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And thank you for taking the time to talk to us today for your work uh, on, on housing and, and development uh, in the Walsh administration and even prior to that. Um, I just wanted to also thank everyone else who joined us today for your questions, for your attention and engagement on these important issues. As I said before, this is the last in our series of candidate conversations. All will be available on our website and on YouTube. Uh, please follow us, uh, Housing Forward Mass, on Twitter, on Facebook, our website, um, and stay engaged. We were going to continue addressing some of these issues, not just in Boston, but across the Commonwealth, and look forward to your engagement. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Uh, thanks again. Thanks, Josh.